EVGA's GTX 1080 Ti FTW3 is another three fan cooler on the bench today, but it's also the most expensive of the 1080 Ti's we've reviewed thus far. This card is $780 right now, $30 more than the new price of the SC2, and $30 more than the MSRP of the Gaming X and Extreme Aorus cards. Our review of the PCB and VRM for the FTW3 gave the card high marks for insane over-engineering on all accounts. Now it's up to the testing to determine if that over-engineering offers any functional value for the extra $30 spent. Before getting to that, this in-depth coverage is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like to help us out directly as that is one of our driving sources of revenue. Or if you prefer a one-time purchase, store.gamersnexus.net for one of our shirts. Our new graph shirts now come in tri-blends, which are very comfortable. We've already got a full PCB and VRM analysis of the FTW3 on the channel. It's pretty in-depth, 26 minutes long, done by resident overclocker Buildzoid. But to recap some of the basics of the cooler and the PCB, this is a two-slot 1080 Ti. For some reason, most of the manufacturers this generation are doing 2.5 or 3-slot cards for the 1080 Ti's. That includes the Gaming X and the Extreme Aorus, which is the biggest one we've looked at thus far. There are very few two-slot cards. This is one of them, as you can see. Uh, so it is a bit smaller than some of the others we've tested. That means it's limited in some ways, like the fan size and the cooler depth, which will impact performance overall, but it's smaller. So that's your trade-off. Now, the card is also way overbuilt in the cooling department. This is something that EVGA absolutely lost their minds after ACX and made apparently a resolution to one, put thermal pads on everything, including fan controllers and inductors and components that don't need the cooling, uh, and two, really beef up their cooling design in general. So uh, the heatsink alone, we kind of detailed in our initial ICX review in February when the ICX line launched. But to recap some of it again, they've, it's, it looks like a standard uh, fin stack. So they've got normal kind of fin density and spacing for the fins. It's just aluminum fins, copper heat pipes throughout the whole thing. It's segmented into two partitions for the GPU and the VRM components. So that's all pretty normal. They've also gone and drilled holes through the cooler, through the heat sink. So that gives you some more surface area and uh, potentially room for the air to pass through. And they've added fins, cylindrical fins, to the base plate, which is different. How much does it help? As we've said in the past, it's kind of hard to say. We did A-B testing of ACX versus ICX with the ICX review in February. And that you should check that out because that has uh, really the, the best coverage we've done to date in terms of testing one cooler versus another. So that will answer the how much does it help question. For this card specifically, though, you're paying a lot of money for over-engineering, basically. And most of that comes in the form of the PCB rather than just the cooling. Uh, as always, it does kind of start to become a question of how much does this really help you? Because with Pascal, you can over-engineer all you want, or you can just throw as many FETs on as you want. You can use as high quality components as you want. Pascal still limits you at the end of the day, particularly in the voltage budget department. That is an NVIDIA limitation. So they've gone in and set BIOS limitations to voltage throughput. It's something like 1.093 volts is about your max if you're lucky. Uh, so at the end of the day, you're always gonna be limited with these cards, but let's recap some of the PCB and VRM stuff and then get into the testing. So Buildzoid's got the full analysis of this on our channel, but the basics EVGA is using NCP81158Ds for the drivers, on semi NCP81162s for the doublers, and Alpha Omega semiconductor 6930s for the memory and core VRM MOSFETs. These are dual end FETs, so you get high side, low side, and diodes all in one package. They are dense. The design is a 10 phase VRM, but it's doubled. So there are five phases doubled because there is no such thing as a 10 phase voltage controller, at least not in this side of the industry, which helps spread the heat load and power load with a copper VRM plate conducting heat to the cooler directly, further helping with the heat sinking and dissipation. That is part of the over design on the cooler. That copper plate is in there. It touches through thermal pads to the VRM components, the MOSFETs and the doublers directly. You can see the imprints on the pads and it's not necessarily needed, but it certainly helps drive down the temperatures. The review today is going to focus almost entirely on thermals and noise. We do have game tests, but just to make a point here, 
Testing gaming performance with multiple 1080 Ti's is going to yield very boring results. We run the test for validation, but uh, the differences are going to be limited because it's a 1080 Ti. It's the same GPU between all of them. And more importantly, there are manufacturing variance uh, issues between cards. So you could, we actually have two of these and they perform slightly differently. Uh, we have two of a lot of the cards and they perform slightly differently. That's because not all chips are created equal particularly with Boost 3.0 designs under NVIDIA. So there's not a whole lot of point to testing gaming uh, on every single 1080 Ti that comes through. We do it for validation, but this will focus on thermals, so keep that in mind. So diving into things, testing methodology will be linked in the description below as always. That's the full article. It has all of the charts in written format if you prefer. The first chart is our clock versus temperature plot, which is used under a power virus scenario to draw maximum power through the card and test its clock stability. Note that this type of test does not enumerate the clock in the same way that a gaming workload would. The frequency is lower here than it would be in games, but power draws significantly higher, particularly with heavier load on the VRM components. The FTW3 is able to leverage its cooler to maintain a stable clock, similar to what we've seen with most 1080 Ti cards we've tested thus far, other than the FE card. The clock has a range and fluctuations of about 50 MHz when held at 66C, indicating relatively consistent frequency throughout the test. That's what we want to see. The flatter, the better for this line. Ramping into other thermal tests, let's first start with a reminder. This is a refresher from our SC2 coverage. This chart shows the SC2 temperatures with and without the holes covered in the shroud, indicating that the holes in the faceplate of EVGA's new design are more for looks than for functionality. These are not functionally better for cooling. The same holds true with the FTW3. They're really just there for looks. Let's move to a test where, just out of pure curiosity, we unplugged the third fan and ran the other two at fixed speeds. This test was conducted with all fans at the same speed. The only difference was disabling the power fan in the second test, just because we figured the over-engineering on the VRM and the cooler would be enough to keep the power components within spec without that third fan. The result is mostly what you'd expect. Running two fans results in higher temperatures, but despite being somewhat expected, this data is still really interesting. We don't normally have this level of access to temperature sensors without placing them on the board ourselves and often limit that to two to three thermocouples. Because there are nine diodes on the ICX cards, we're able to fully understand the impact of a two fan versus three fan cooler across the PCB, not just from the GPU and our own thermocouples. So using EVGA's NTC thermistors, as far as power component temperatures are concerned, it's really not that much of a loss to move to two fans. The overbuilt VRM and the heat sinks do their job keeping the VRM components within spec in our tests. Even that 87C number for Power 4 isn't terrible, but Power 4 isn't a MOSFET on this card. It's actually the back of the PCB behind one of the VRAM components above the GPU, but still, not that bad. What's more interesting is that the third fan, which EVGA has positioned over those components, seems to most heavily impact the GPU temperature itself. GPU diode temperatures increased by roughly 10C without the third fan spinning, despite the fact that the GPU and memory fans, the leftmost two fans, are spinning at the same speed as with three fans. This indicates that the heat pipes and right side of the sink are dissipating a significant amount of heat from the GPU silicon and that the third fan is necessary to dump that heat from the fins. We can validate these numbers by looking at GPU backside temperatures, which have risen about 6C also. The memory components really don't seem to care either way. They are certainly benefited by the third fan, but the difference is about six to seven Celsius and those memory modules are rated for well over the heat that they're experiencing in both tests. So although that's not something you're likely to do, disabling the third fan, it does help us understand how the cooler functions. The third fan is not really all that important for power temperatures because we're still way within spec, which means you could build a fan profile to spin that fan slower and not have to worry about your VRM components like the FETs heating up too much. So that helps with noise when you're profiling the fan, but uh, GPU temperature does go up a bit because you're losing some of the dissipation potential over this entire half of the heat sink which obviously touches a bit of everything on the car, not just the power components. This next chart shows temperatures versus the SC2 card. Unfortunately, half of this chart is useless. Here's why. EVGA positions its SC2 and FTW3 thermistors in different locations on the board, which we can show on the screen now. This means that despite really wanting to compare the two directly, we really can't. Power reading 4, for instance, is really warm on the FTW3, and much warmer than on the SC2 in the side-by-side -side comparison, but it's also on the back of the PCB with the FTW3, 
located behind a VRAM module and above the GPU backside. That's going to be a really hot spot of the board. And the SC2 positions its Power 4 module on the front side and within the MOSFET region. So it's measuring a completely different location on the board and even a different side. Going back to our thermals chart between the two, you can see how this difference plays out. Power 4 on the SC2 looks significantly lower, but it's also measuring a different component. These are therefore not directly comparable aside from the two GPU temperatures and some of the memory temperatures. Fortunately, we also position our own thermocouples on all the cards and put those in the same spot each time, so we can directly compare these readings. Let's look at the FTW3 components we measured with thermocouples as opposed to the ICX NTC thermistors, then compare those against MSI Gigabyte and the NVIDIA FE cards. We're still expanding on this chart. This is brand new and we're excited with more detail for it in the future, including VRAM and fixed 40 dBA output tests. For now, this is where it's starting. With auto settings for the coolers, all cards running out of box clocks, we see the EVGA 10 ATI FTW3 keeps lower power temperatures than everyone else, meaning that they could sacrifice some in the cooling department for lower noise. This is a common trend with EVGA where the auto fan is aggressively profiled compared to the competition. At 63.7 Celsius for the power measurement on the middle of the FETs, EVGA runs nearly 20C cooler power components than Gigabyte, who we remarked ran warm in our Extreme Aorist review and about 7C cooler than the Gaming X. So far, the EVGA FTW3 is the coolest 1080 Ti that we've tested to date for both GPU diode and power component temperatures, but there's another component to a cooler, and that's noise. Until we add our 40 dBA fixed temperature testing, let's look at the normal noise charts. Under idle conditions, the fans spin down to zero RPM, just like other cards do right now. That said, we've noticed that the fan does like to spin up to 700 somewhat regularly on the GPU, but you could shut that functionality down with the custom curve. Auto conditions place the EVGA FTW3 at 42.2 dBA, whereas the MSI Gaming X operates about 36.5 dBA, and the Gigabyte Extreme Aorus is about 38.8 dBA. Considering both of these cards run warmer than the FTW3, which is the coolest of the 1080 Ti's thus far, it makes sense that the quieter cards would run a bit warmer. The really interesting test will be our fixed DBA temperature tests, which are still underway and will be posted separately. Regardless, for now, the EVGA FTW3 sits perceptibly louder than the Extreme Aorus and Gaming X, though the Gaming X deserves praise for its significantly lower noise levels, which are made possible by the fat cooler and taller height fans. EVGA's FTW3 fans are about 90 millimeters across, whereas the Gaming X uses about 100 millimeter fans. Let's move on to some brief game tests. Our overclock stepping chart is on the screen now. We weren't able to push our FTW3s too high, but that's been true for basically every 1080 Ti we've come across thus far. These cards are already up against frequency limits on Pascal and aren't particularly impressive overclockers with thanks to voltage limitations imposed by NVIDIA's BIOS. Running Ghost Recon at 4K, the 1080Ti FTW3 is the fastest of the non-overclocked 1080Ti cards, running an average FPS only marginally higher than the SC2. And this is within test-to-test -test variance, by the way, so we can fairly state that the SC2 and FTW3 are functionally equal in average FPS. The Gaming X is next down the line at 58 average, with the Extreme Aorus at about 57 average. There's no meaningful difference between any of these cards when it comes to pure FPS, which makes sense in a world where Boost 3.0 largely equalizes cards with the same chip anyway. Overclocking the FTW3 isn't particularly exciting either, despite the PCB's higher quality. We'll highlight those numbers anyway, but again, it doesn't really matter how much you engineer these boards. Without power mods and hard mods, you're not going to be able to overcome the voltage and power limits established by NVIDIA. And NVIDIA establishes those, they say, for safety because the 400 series and 600 series had a lot of people overvolting beyond where they should have. At 1440p, Ghost Recon's performance is largely the same stack. The FTW3 runs an average of 95 with 1% lows at 82 and 0.1% lows at 80. Comparatively, the Gaming X operates at 93.7 average with the Extreme Aorus also at 93.7 FPS average and the SC2 at about 95 FPS average. Overclocking helps out marginally once again, but we don't quite break 100 FPS. Running Doom with Vulcan at 4K, the EVGA 1080Ti FTW3 is once again the fastest stock card on the bench, even versus the Titan XP in this case, and it outperforms our Gaming X by about 1.2%. That's certainly not jaw-dropping gains and can be partially accounted for with chip-to-chip -chip manufacturing variants, but it is a lead nonetheless. The FTW3 also outranks our Gigabyte Extreme card by 4.5% as the Extreme Aorus is running into power limits under stock conditions without pushing the power budget further. Overclocking moves ranks around a bit, but again, gains are limited overall for the 1080 Ti class cards. Sniper Elite 4 with DX12 and Async Compute lands the 1080 Ti FTW3 again at the top of the stack for the 1080 Ti listings. 
just barely ahead of the MSI Gaming X. In fact, these two are effectively identical as they're within test-to-test -test variants. We're 2 FPS ahead of the Extreme card, or about 2.8%, which does fall out of variance, but is not really that exciting. If you really want more game benchmarks, they will be in the article linked in the description below. It's just that we're looking at something where thermals and noise matter a whole lot more than gaming performance, because once you've established a baseline for gaming between the AIB partner cards, it doesn't change a whole lot. It's not like they make the actual GPU. They're just making the cooler and the board, so you're going to run into limits no matter what. Uh, so the gaming axes and extremes can swap places between reviewers just because you might they have different quality chips and the same is true here this is on our bench the highest performing stock card but at times that's a difference of one percent or less in some cases so it's not an fps thing we're talking about here in terms of thermals and noise which is what actually matters this runs a more aggressive fan profile than some of the other cards the gaming x included so that means it's a bit louder but it's also cooler it's one of those trade-offs. You could build a custom fan profile with this and probably should if you buy one because that power fan doesn't need to run as fast as, really none of them need to run as fast as they do. You could run higher temperatures with a lower noise level, probably get around or under 40 dBA and still be just fine in the temperature department unless you're in a really hot ambient environment. So uh, that stated, just like the SC2, you should tune fans if you buy this card but this is a $780 card, so it's a tough sell. The others are $750. The SC2 was originally something like $720, which was a really good buy. Now it's $750. I think that was a pre-order thing. Uh, but at $780, we're $30 over every other card we've reviewed. The PCB is fantastic engineering. It's really well done. BuildZoid breaks it all down in our video. The cooler is good engineering. The ICX stuff is pretty cool, but uh, it does not make the gaming experience better it, that's just it's how these things work so what you're looking at is short of doing shunt mods and hard mods you're stuck at a power limit and a voltage limit that means you can't overclock more than the competition uh, in fact most of the overclocking limits are going to be more chip to chip variants than the pcb itself unless you buy a really really bad pcb uh, so it's it's just a question of what is what do you get for an extra 30 dollars over an sc2 the answer is a fan so what do you do with that? Okay, you can run them at slower speeds and get lower noise output, maybe. A decibel or two. So maybe that's valuable to you. But the SC2 is already pretty good. It's $30 cheaper. It does all the same gaming, overclocking, everything, really. The Gaming X is a bit quieter and is reasonable in every aspect as well. The Extreme Aorus is okay. It's the warmest and it's louder than the Gaming X. Not really. I'd be looking at the Gaming X, the SC2, or the FTW3, and only the FTW3 if you really, really want it for some specific reason. Otherwise, the SC2 is a better buy at the price. Uh, both of them are two-slot coolers, which is perhaps the primary difference and advantage over something like the Gaming X. Uh, otherwise, back to what we were saying on the previous reviews, at $750, uh, there are a lot of cards that are 720 and 730 from EVGA included that would probably suit you just as well, but have slightly less flashy coolers and components and still perform more or less the same. Noise levels on these $750 cards though are pretty good, especially if you're gonna custom tune them. So that's it, uh, great PCB, good cooler. It's a little louder than the competition, a little cooler as well. Uh, so it just comes down to how much you value those things, but uh, I'm having a hard time seeing why to buy this over an SC2, considering for 99% of people, they are functionally the same. So if you know a reason, great, buy it for that reason. But uh, I don't have one for you. So uh, that's all. As always, patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. You can hit the link in the description below for the full review of this card with all the charts in written format or store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our shirts. We have the GN Graph shirts now in tri-blend. So definitely check those out. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.